is Sam Kitterji McKimbrell. Um, he's a lovely gentleman from uh, from the Valley, um, who I, 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 I had the benefit of uh, meeting Sam last year at PyCon, and uh, met him again accidentally at PyCon Pi Ohio uh, a couple of months later. No, it was a Yes, it was a couple of weeks later. Yeah, um, and at that time, uh, Sam did he did a a little keen, a little um, uh, lightning talk uh, about something that had been bugging him because some people had been talking about uh, all this wonderful technology they were using that was completely inappropriate for the purposes for which they were applying it, and he gave a fantastic little uh, um, a little lightning talk that uh, many people, myself included, said needed to be turned into a full length talk. As, as fast as humanly possible. And so uh, when the opportunity arose to give Sam the, uh, the keynote spot or the, clo the closing, uh, closing uh, uh, invited speaker spot for today, I uh, couldn't pass that one up. So uh, with very, much, very, very great pleasure to introduce to the stage, Sam Gittajima Kimbrell. How about now? Yeah. Great. OK, um, so I think I, I'm going to choose to believe that Jack and the gentleman in yellow were just uh, holding time for late arrivals to get in here. I saw people wandering in, so thank you for that, increasing the audience. Uh, so yes, uh, this is Bowerbirds of Technology. Um, thanks, everybody, for attending the conference today. I'm very honored to be closing. Uh, these are Bowerbirds. If you're not familiar with them, um, they're birds. They build these structures called bowers out of sticks and colorful objects that they find in their environment in an effort to attract mates. We'll come back to them later. Uh, please, for now, just enjoy the nice photos of birds that I found on Flickr. Speaking of Flickr, Cal Henderson, I think, um, I even called out this morning um, for an I Hate Django talk. In that talk, he actually said that most websites are not in the top 100 websites. It turns out, if you do the math, all but 100 of them are not in the top 100. <laughs> I can take no credit for that joke. That is exactly his phrasing. But thank you for the laugh. Um, more on this point. This is a Zipfian distribution. Um, it says that the number of links or traffic or users or whatever metric you want to pick for a given spot in the ranking of websites is inversely proportional to that ranking. Um, this happens to be Wikipedia articles, and the axes uh, of note are log log, so it, it doesn't turn into, turn into some sort of 1 over x there. Um, many empirical studies of the web have shown that this holds true. So my point, and I think uh, Andrew made this in his talk earlier before the break, is that you're not Google, or unless you work at Google. Um, but that's OK. Tons of products work really great for the people who use them at not Google scale. I'm also not Google. Uh, if you're in the back and can't see, this is me with a slightly different hair color. Um, currently, I work at Twilio, which is large and pretty fast growing, but not Google. And uh, for about seven years or so, I've been working on other similarly large and fast growing, but not Google web services. So I'd like to open uh, by discussing what Google and Facebook and Amazon and the rest of them kind of at the very tippy top worry about. So first, they worry about absurdly high throughput and storage demands. I'm talking millions, tens of millions of requests per second and exabytes of data. They deal with tens of thousands of servers in hundreds of data centers across the world that are managed and deployed to by thousands of developers. And they have near unlimited resources, right? If you look at Google's quarterly statements, we're talking about billions of dollars. To get specific, I have a couple case studies, um, just two really brief things to talk through. Uh, first up is Uber. And um, side note, Uber has given us plenty of bad examples in non-technological things. And this is emphatically not an endorsement of any of their behavior towards human beings. But it's a kind of interesting technological story. Uh, Uber hit scaling issues with Postgres and decided they were going to write their own data storage tier. They blogged about it uh, three times. And you can go read about it. It's pretty fascinating. They started by talking about what they were looking for and some quotes from that. They wanted to linearly add capacity to their storage tier by adding more servers. Uber wanted to favor write availability, availability over being able to read your own writes. And they wanted event notifications. Uh, the sidebar here is they said, quote, we had an asynchronous event system built on Kafka 0.7, and we couldn't get it to run lossless. Um, if you're not familiar with Kafka, Kafka 0.8, the very next release, introduced uh, the correct behavior to run lossless. Have you tried upgrading? So what is schema list then? What did they build? 
They built an append-only, sparse, three-dimensional, persistent hash map, very similar to Google's Bigtable. To which my only reply is this slightly infamous comic. <laughs> Here it is again. <laughs> so the point is that this is a cost, a cost for your developers. And that shows up in the form of new abstractions. Right? Writing your own data store like this means that the boundary between the app and the database changes. Uh, your app has to know and enforce schemas and persistence strategies, kind of down to every last detail means that they went deliberately for eventual consistency. Uh, like they said earlier, you can't read things that you just wrote, and maybe neither can other processes for some undefined amount of time. They gave up the ability to do flexible queries against their data sets. Uh, if you read the posts, they say that you have to know your query patterns ahead of time because you only have a fixed set of indexes. Uh, the system enforces mandatory sharding, so you can't do global reads without a lot of extra work in your application. Uh, and there's no joins. And finally, uh, and probably most important for everybody who is not Uber or Google-sized, they gave up developer familiarity, right? So you can't hire fast for people who are going to work on this. People aren't going to walk in knowing this. And good luck using contractors. So that was Uber. Next, Amazon. Uh, about a couple years ago, um, a guy named Steve Yegi quit Amazon and joined Google. Um, Somewhere down the line after that, he accidentally made public a long rant on Google Plus about how Amazon was going to eat Google's lunch because Google didn't understand how to do platforms. Um, a large part of this post was devoted to how Amazon got their, kind of their infamous for this, their service architecture. Uh, he says that in 2002 or so, Jeff Bezos issued this company-wide mandate, something along the lines of the following. One, all teams will henceforth expose their data and functionality through service interfaces. Two, teams must communicate with each other through these interfaces. There will be no other form of inter-process communication allowed whatsoever. No linking, no service calls, uh, sorry, no, uh, no library linking, no connecting to other people's databases. The only communication allowed is via the documented service interfaces over the network. Doesn't matter what technology they use, HTTP, Corba because it was 2002, uh, PubSub, custom protocols, doesn't matter. And all service interfaces, without exception, must be designed from the ground up to be externalizable. Uh, externalizable here means exposed to the outside world, i.e. to customers, and sold as a product. And if you can't guess, this is where Amazon Web Services came from. And finally, because Jeff Bezos is serious about things, anybody who doesn't do this will be fired. <laughs> Amazon was and is still very serious about this. They also learned things about the cost of doing things like this. Steve came back later in his post to talk about this. So some of the things that they learned were that, quote, pager escalation gets way harder because a ticket might bounce through 20 service calls before the real owner is identified. That every single one of your peer teams suddenly becomes a potential denial of service attacker. That monitoring and QA are the same thing because sometimes the only thing still functioning in the server is the little component that knows how to say, I'm fine, roger, roger, over and out, in a cheery droid voice. <laughs> and that if you have all these services, you won't be able to find any of them without a service discovery mechanism, which relies on a service registry, which is itself another service. So with this, as with kind of the Uber example, um, what I'm trying to say here is that having this sort of massively scalable infrastructure costs you in developer time because the mental model is that much more complicated. And when you're a five-person shop, a 50-person shop, 200 people, you don't have a lot of developer time the way Google does. So at this point, you might be saying, I want to be Google. Um, I'd like you to keep in mind that aspiring to be Google is great, but even Google wasn't Google overnight. Some numbers are not. Um, this is an interview with Ben Gomez, uh, an early Google engineer. When I joined Google, it would take them about a month to crawl and build an index of 50 million pages. This was 1999. And they also, at the time, were doing about 10,000 queries per day. Yeah, per day. Google in 2006 published that they were doing that same 10,000 queries per second. So you've got seven years 
to do that growth. Google in 2012 said that now it takes them about one minute to index those 50 million pages. So that's what the ramp looks like. And even sometimes Google still is not Google. I have it on good authority from people who work at Google that there are a lot of things internally that still run on just vanilla uncharted MySQL that just has some nodes attached to it. Really, they don't solve problems they don't have. Which goes to show that even boring, quote unquote, technology can go really far. Uh, if you were at PyCon US this year, um, we learned that Instagram is still a Django monolith. And as far as I can tell, they don't even seem to be using async IO. Uh, my team at Twilio, uh, we still rely on horizontally sharded relational databases, which is you know, a 15 year old pattern at this point. But for us, it goes 20,000 MPS, 20,000 writes per second, and we still get full ACID. So write full consistency, atomicity, isolation, durability, all those nice things that make it really easy to write apps against a database. So yeah, exponential growth feels slow at first, right? If you and your product are lucky enough to experience the twin joys of irrational exuberance and exponential growth, the low part of the curve is gentle, right? It gives you warning. You see it coming. And second of all, most importantly, there's no single point where your entire app is just going to say, oh no, 10,000 requests, I can't possibly do that and just die irrevocably. That doesn't happen, right? You start to feel the pain your 99th gets slow, it comes on you, you can see it coming, um, and you have time to respond. So with that in mind, if you do start hitting that ramp, um, iterate. Find the thing that's most on fire, evolve it or replace it to cope with your new scale, and then go find the, th the next most on fire thing. All right. So at this point, I, I hope some of you are starting to think, well, OK, fine, I'm not Google yet. Um, so what? What should I worry about instead? And so I have some guidelines for you on how to focus on building apps that are easy for you to develop on and easy to scale at your current scale. First up, user trust is the most important thing. You're never going to get to a billion users if you burn them by leaking their credit card numbers. Right? Maintain their trust, meet their needs. You also really want fast and easy development. Developer time is your most precious resource, so don't waste it. You want to be able to move fast without breaking things. You want quiet on call. Um, I'm going to go into this a little bit. The tech industry has a problem with on call and pager rotations. Uh, if you look at the people in the world, not just the tech industry, everybody out of all 7 billion of us who do on call correctly, it, it's places where life safety is critical, right? So hospitals, um, nuclear power plants, firefighters, and so on. Um, let's do some math. There are 168 hours in a week. Usually, we want a 40-hour work week. Um, unions fought for our right for this. If you divide out, that's 4.2 people. Uh, we can't have a fractional person, so we have five. Um, now, multiply the other way, and you have 32 hours left for a PTO, sick time, uh, anything else that might come up and take somebody out of your rotation for a little bit. So let's call it six to be safe. Right, uh, show of hands if you do this. For the video, there are zero hands up, because this is expensive, right? That's six times your load, your cost, just to get a real on-call rotation. So all right, we're not going to do this. Um, how do we make on-call less awful? First, uh, one of the things that has come out of DevOps culture is that employing humans to be robots is bad. So don't do it. Uh, your on-call's job, hopefully, in the ideal world, is to get paged at 2 AM maybe once a week, hopefully once a month. Uh, find the thing that broke and make it never do that again. When people are on call, you need to give them the time and space to do this. Empower them to fix the things instead of just patching them over. On a related note, um, you want appropriate availability and scalability for your scale. Um, you're not going to go from 10,000 requests a day from, to 10,000 per second overnight. right? Like I said, it took Google seven years. Um, you're not even going to get there in one year. You should have an obvious path of, to scaling your app by a factor of 10, and a rough line of sight, a kind of notion of how you're going to get to a factor of 100. And think about just how available and reliable you need to be. Are you a telecom company, or did you write an office appointment system for doctor's offices that's only ever going to be used between the hours of 8 and 5? We'll come back to this. So with all that in mind, um, Andrew pointed out before the break uh, that you don't have to reinvent the wheel. I'm going to say that instead, you should build bowers. So the birds are back. 
uh, bowerbirds, like I said, they build structures from materials they find in their environment to attract mates. Um, we want to build software, and the modern software ecosystem, open source and hosted, everything's out there, is our found environment. Uh, we want, our goal is to have healthy relationships with our users and our developers. So what we should do is find what we need to solve our, our sub-problems, combine it using our own special business logic, that's why we're doing this, and basically build this beautiful technological bower to make our users happy. So for the rest of the time today, I'm going to talk about uh, how to make technical decisions within this framework, uh, and then how to run your team and business with all this in mind. So first, uh, let's talk about picking technologies. Um, so we need a bottle cap, it seems, according to this bird. What is this bottle cap? Uh, it could be a database, could be a browser framework, web server, it doesn't really matter. Um, the point is generic. Uh, what do we want to think about when we're doing this? How do we find our bottle caps? Uh, Jen, this morning, said uh, JavaScript fatigue is a real thing, right? Because um, there's, it's a new, new environment, new community, lots of stuff comes on the scene very quickly. Um, Avoid this. You don't have to try every new thing that comes along. So with that in mind, um, you might want to pick things based on the maturity of the projects. Uh, Django is a good example here. Um, things that are not brand speaking new, and, but on the other side, things that are not in the Apache attic, which is where they put retired projects. Uh, you also want maintainership for that piece of software you're going to adopt. Uh, importantly, it should not be solely by the company that wrote it the first time before they open sourced it. Um, Apache here if the pro is the standard, really, uh, if the project isn't big enough for something of its own, like the DSF. Uh, and also, the flip side of maintainership is what does the release velocity look like? How fast are updates coming out? All right, security. This is big. There were talks on this today. You should search the database for CVEs, so exploits that are known against the project. Uh, how many were there? Uh, were they resolved at all? Uh, how quickly were they resolved? And when patches come out for critical security phones, how hard is it going to be to patch this thing? Right? Are we talking about uh, just bump some pointers on your CDN or redeploy your entire database tier? Also, stability. Uh, there's two types here. Right? So first, there's API stability. Um, we all love semantic versioning. Some people do it better than others. Uh, is version 2.0 going to come out tomorrow and offer you great features at the cost of breaking every integration you have? And the other type of stability is system stability, right? So does the database actually database, or does it just pretend it took your data and drop it on the floor? The ecosystem of the project is also really important to think about. Um, is there library support for your language of choice? Are developers aware and familiar with this thing? Can you hire people fast enough, right? That this is the opposite of what Uber hit with schemaless uh, and building your own stuff. If you hire somebody, how fast are they going to ramp up on your particular pieces of technology that you've chosen? Can you find consultants to know it? Um, so picking technology that everybody knows, even if it's quote unquote boring, means that you don't have to wait three months for your new devs to be productive on your stack. And uh, out of the boxiness, this is uh, Josh Simmons used this in a talk he gave, I think, at um, I don't remember which conference, but it doesn't matter. Um, the friction of using this system, right? What's the first 30 minutes that you experience with this thing like? Um, are there Docker files to get it deployed to your infrastructure? What's it like when you download it to your Mac um, and unpack it? How easy is it to turn on? And the documentation. Does it exist? <laughs> is it up to date? Is it comprehensive? Searchable? Discoverable? These are all really important things. When you figure out that uh, the kind of happy path that's in the, how, the quick start on the front page of the site is no longer exactly what you need. When you need to deviate from that, you want comprehensive API docs. All right, uh, support and consultants. Can you get a support contact from somebody? Because when your Postgres instance dies at 1 AM and turns out your backups for the last three months are corrupt, you will probably want some help. And finally, uh, there are things to be aware of when it comes to licensing. Um, for example, GPL software cannot go in the Apple App Store. Or more recently in the news, um, Apache Foundation declared that Facebook's license and patent grant model uh, was no good. Uh, panic ensued until Facebook relicensed React and uh, RocksDB. So that's things you should think about in, when picking open source software and also software in general. Um, you can also buy software, right? So building things ourselves from scratch or finding open source projects aren't our only choices. We can pay money for people to solve problems for us. 
if we think we want to do that, how should we decide? How should we decide whether we actually want to pay for that hosted solution or to build something ourselves? What's it going to cost? Right? Uh, how long is it going to take? And what would you lose in the meantime by not having it tomorrow? And there's two costs to think about here. Not only do you not get the shiny monitoring solution tomorrow, you have to choose something else on your product roadmap not to build for the next month because you're using up your developer time to build your monitoring solution. And how hard is it to replace? Right? So if the vendor goes down, what happens? Um, is this our source control and we just have a copy of the Git repo somewhere else that we can put onto whatever we find to replace it? Or was this our platform vendor? What happens if they go out of business? OK. So that's a lot about technology, um, how to select it, how to use it. I'd like to talk about relationships and our services and our projects. How should we run things from here out? What should our relationships with our customers look like? Because we care about our users a lot, because we want to have a billion of them, right? That's how we get to Google scale. So first, uh, let's go back to what I said earlier about uptime and set some reasonable goals. Here comes some math again. Two nines of uptime, 99% uptime is 3.65 days per year. OK, that one was obvious. Uh, 7.2 hours per month of unplanned outages, 1.6 hours per week, or 14 and a half minutes per day. This is reasonably doable, um, even if you're just kind of taking your credit card out and paying for machines in Amazon and not thinking about it too much. Three nines, you have to really have some intent to get there. That's eight and three quarters hours every, out of the year that you can be down uh, less than an hour per month, 10 minutes a week, or one and a half minutes per day. Four nines is where it starts to get really difficult. And it's hard to find hosted companies that will give you a contract with an SLA for four nines. Even telecom usually goes for three and a half, quote unquote. Um, <laughs> four nines is less than an hour per year, or nine seconds of downtime per day. Um, and finally, five nines is 5.26 minutes per year, and less than a second per day. Things that are implied by this are that if you can have nine seconds of downtime per day at the four nines level, you have to be able to detect and recover from failure in nine seconds. You can't have a human in the loop. So keep that in mind and set goals appropriately. You want to be able to survive failure. If you inevitably do have that outage that's coming, uh, how are we going to get through it and keep your customer base around? First, you need to have empathy. So understand what it means to your customers when you're unavailable. Uh, something that I keep in mind because I work at Twilio uh, there are nonprofits that use the Twilio platform for doing things like rescuing the victims of human trafficking via an SMS hotline. So when we go down, I feel it. And I know that that's important because their lives hanging in the balance. So keep, keep that in mind, but don't let that block you, right? Um, when that comes up, remember why, why you're doing what you're doing that is important, um, or not important as the case may be, right? If you have Instagram for cats, maybe the cats don't care. Um, but keep that in mind, right? Remember that somebody wants to use your thing. Uh, you let that drive you, and then get back to the problem of actually solving it. And using that empathy, set expectations. So manage expectations ahead of time. So make sure that you're not committing to an SLA that you can't deliver. And as always, uh, under-promising and over-delivering is a good strategy. Never fails. You should also over-communicate. Talk to your users. You should have a status page. You should update it when you even think that there might be a problem, not when your customers tell you. And speaking of status pages, don't do this. <laughs> yes, this, this actually happened. This is February when Amazon went down. Um, the postmortem included the fact that they couldn't update the status page because the status page was dependent on their own technology. <laughs> if you're hosted on Amazon, put your status page on Google Cloud Platform. If you're on Google, put it on Azure, right, and so on. Uh, another amazing case of radical transparency in how to handle outages, when GitLab went down, they had a major incident. Somebody basically accidentally the entire database. And uh, what they did was they actually put up a Google document and updated their incident notes. Right? This was their engineering team communicating with each other in front of their entire public, in front of their entire customer base. So doing that restored a huge amount of their customer trust. Right? Not only can you see that they're aware that there's a problem, you're watching exactly what they're doing to help fix it. So yeah, over-communicate. Staff up your social media. Staff up, puts people staffing your Zendesk or whatever uh, support solution you're using, and then listen to them. And also measure their performance, because uptime isn't the only SLA. When tickets come in, 
You want to measure how fast it's how long it takes you to respond to those tickets for the first time, the first response time, how long it takes you to actually resolve the issue for the customer. And finally, um, the overall satisfaction score, right? Just on the scale of one to five, did we actually solve your problem for you or were we useless? All right. And then disaster recovery, because worse than outages, disasters are going to happen. You should identify your fault domains. And uh, this is, if you're on Amazon, right, we'll use them as an example because I do a lot of work on them. Um, is the Amazon node that hosts your failure domain, right? Do you want to be able to tolerate your host disappearing from under you? You probably should do this. Um, do you want to tolerate the entire availability zone disappearing out from underneath you? How about the entire region? And again, there are costs and trade-offs here, right? So what's reasonable for you to architect for, to build around failures at? And practice, please. Exercise your failover mechanisms. Exercise your backup recovery, particularly test your backups ahead of time, under controlled conditions. You'll thank me later. And please do consider security. There are a lot of really great resources here. Um, first up is the Open Web Application Security Project. Uh, go to their website. They have immensely useful guides to just about everything. They have a list of the top 10 threats that happen and vulnerabilities that are exploited against web applications. You should read it and be familiar with them so you can build against them and keep them out of your systems as you go. Know your threat model. So what this means is you need to understand what the valuable assets are inside your system. What are people going to go after if they do break into your data center, if they do break into your environment? Know the vectors of attack. How are people going to get into your systems? And then with those things in mind, make sure you can design effective mitigations. So if we anticipate that people might try to inject SQL into our forms, we should put a sanitizer in place so that we don't allow the SQL strings to go directly to the database, and we should probably use parameterized queries, right? Um, so how are you going to block things as, um, as they come up? Uh, some really obvious things. Don't check your credentials into Git. And also, don't do this. This is, this is a real paper. Um, these people scanned the internet. And they found uh, several thousands of MongoDBs with zero access controls hosting production data. Don't do that. Don't be in those papers. And just like everything else, communicate. Security breaches are serious, but they're also just like any other incident. The longer you keep them secret, the longer you don't talk about them, the worse the backlash is going to be, and you're going to lose those users, and you're never going to get to Google scale. Talk about what was compromised. Talk about how it was compromised, for how many people, and answer whether it's going to happen again. And the, there's really one, only one answer here, which is no. So that's that. Uh, that was a lot of stuff. Um, I hope that my advice helps you get more content and comfortable, no matter how big or small your system is. Uh, we might not all be Google or Facebook, but we can all learn from their paths to the dizzying heights of scale. And we can all adopt code and ideas from them and everybody else who came before us to build amazing new bowers of technology for our users. One final note is that before I thought of the bower bird as a metaphor for this topic, for this talk, uh, the only other thing I had going was dung beetles. <laughs> so aren't you glad that this was a half hour of bird pictures instead? All right, thank you. Happy Bauer building. Thank you very much, Sam. Uh, wonderful presentation. Thank you for uh, sharing your experiences and advising what we should, should and shouldn't be thank looking you. for. Um, again, by way of thank you, uh, a complimentary mug and All postcard. Right. With a, thank you. With a thanks. So thank you very much, Sam. All right. And we'll do